Um, so there's just so many dynamics within the, the world of gaming that, you know, you can go into that world, you can train, just make sure that you're not stuck in there for too long, right? So the, the message here is just gaming creates leaders. And I, I think it's a really important thing for people that uh, to understand that you shouldn't be, you know, down on yourself because you, you know, you're, you're good at games or um, you're spending a lot of time on it. Just understand that you're in the shadow world and you have to eventually come out of it. Hey guys, Nathan Chan here, Sion Publisher of Founder Magazine. Welcome back to another Founder episode. If you aren't subscribed, make sure you subscribe. Make sure you give us a thumbs up and leave a comment below this video. Now today's guest is named Eric Sue. He's an incredible founder. He used to be a gamer. And we're gonna talk about the 15 power-ups you need to use to build successful businesses and a successful life. Extremely smart guy, really fun conversation. Really excited to speak with him. You don't wanna miss this, especially if you're a gamer. All right, guys, let's jump in. Eric, thanks so much for taking the time to speak with me today. Thanks for having me again, Nathan. The last time we did this was probably six years ago, so it, it's been a while. Um, and so, you know, my name is Eric Sue. I help level up the world through marketing. I uh, have a couple of marketing businesses. One's a software company, one's an ad agency. I also invest in a couple of uh, MarTech SaaS companies. Um, have a podcast called Marketing School, another one called Leveling Up. And then i uh, got the book coming out called Leveling Up as well. And uh, last time we did this, man, I was talking about getting rid of the agency and, and, and doing the senior living thing. So I, I'm happy to update on that as well. So, oh, yeah, that's right. Crazy. So, yeah, you started, no, you bought Single Grain, right? You bought it from, uh, what's his name? Sujan. Sujan Patel, yeah. yeah Sujan, yes. And then you've really grown that agency. Now you've taken a step back. You're now the chairman. Um, so you remember YPO now, so you've, you've leveled up. I'm actually in the application phase as well, review on as awesome. well. Yeah. And um, you started the SaaS company, ClickFlow. And also you started, I remember literally like a few years back, you emailed me and said, hey, I'm starting a podcast with Neil Patel and we want to get to a million downloads a month. Like, what do you think we should do? And <laughs> I was like, oh, geez, that, that's a lot of downloads. Like, we don't get that many. Um, but, yeah, you, I know you did that. You smashed it. So, yeah, what's been happening since? Dude, it's, it's been a lot. I mean, it's um, – so that year that we talked, um, Single Green was about to fold. And, and that's when my outside accounting firm called me and said, hey, it might be time to shut it down. Um, so I, I actually took it over and I made it worse. We dropped all the way down to one employee. Um, and I was just like, okay, what else can I be doing? Right. I almost took another job. You know, the job was going to be really well paying, very cushy. Um, and then, you know, there's a senior living thing I was talking about. It was just, it was a tough time. Right. Um, so I didn't know what I was doing. I literally, I read this book called let my people go surfing and I, I took it literally it's from the Patagonia founder. It's a really good book, but it's just, I was like, oh yeah, don't micromanage people. Uh, don't, you know, don't, don't try to control people and all that, which you don't want to do. Right. But I took it too literally. So I stopped showing up to the office. Um, and I was like, yeah, you know, they'll figure it out. So that's what happened. Um, but since then, I mean, it's, you know, we, we've kind of narrowed down the focus to, you know, if, if you were to strip me down to my essence, I just love learning and I love teaching. Right. And that's really what's led us to build what we've built so far around the marketing world. We have the audience and we kind of just plug in whatever makes sense to that. And then things just grow. So that focus, that level of focus, I didn't discover that until a couple years later. So, so I have to ask, like, how did you turn the business around? Like, what happened? What changed? I mean, honestly, I I, I failed forward, right? I think, um, you know, I, I was talking to um, one of so the 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 guy that runs ClickFlow, the, my my GM. I was talking to him yesterday. I was like, look, if I were to go back in time. Um, would I do the same thing? Definitely not because I was trying to save the company while I was trying to start the podcast while I was trying to do all this. I was trying to do SEO for the website too, just a lot of different things, but that's allowed us to get to where we are now. Um, but if I were to tell my younger self, Hey, you know, what's one word, it would definitely be focus. So, um, and then in terms of kind of what specifically we did to save the agency, we got lucky because the year where everything was tanking, we had tried to convert it from an SEO agency to a content marketing agency. Um, everything fell apart there, didn't work out. And, but I was doing SEO on the website and then that started to take off. So we started to rank highly for certain keywords like agency related keywords. And that's how we started to get clients like Amazon, Uber, and these clients. Um, initially we, we dropped out, we dropped down the one employee, 
I couldn't fulfill the work anymore. So we started referring the leads out when we started taking 25 to 30% commission on each one. And then that kept us afloat. We're doing like, you know, 600, 700 grand a year. That was profit on the affiliate stuff. Then we started to slowly build back the agency and focusing it on paid media. Got you. I see. So at right now, like at single grain, you guys just focus on SEO and paid and content. Correct. It's SEO paid uh, and, and content. Yeah. Those are the main things. And we primarily work with SaaS companies, uh, e-commerce and education. We've, we've also narrowed down our focus too. So that part's really important. Yeah, got you. And at this point right now, um, I assume you guys are, you know, eight feet at multiple eight figures annual revenue and um, you put recently a CEO in. When did you step back? Yeah. So I, we, by the way, we tried the CEO experiment a couple of times. Um, and, and, you know, what, what I've learned from that is, um, you know, you want to hire people that have actually done it instead of people that have potential. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we've tried it a couple of years ago. And then, um, you know, we actually tried it recently. And so, you know, the update on this right now is we're looking for a new CEO because we had to, we had to let go, unfortunately, the, of the second one, right? Both times it was hiring for potential. Um, and they're great people, by the way. Um, what I would say around that is, you know, working above the business and kind of, you know, at least for me, I love thinking about things from a strategic standpoint. So I love jumping around and I love thinking about hiring or what other deals can we do? The highest leverage thing I can do is deals or create content like how we're doing right now. Um, and that's, that's also what gives me energy too. And then the final thing I'll say is um, around kind of the single grain thing for now is to back up a second. The reason I took the agency over was because I always wanted to use it as my funding mechanism. I understood that, if I were able to take the company over and then turn it around, my upside would be asymmetric, right? It was just unlimited upside. My downside would be if I failed, I would learn a lot from, you know, taking over this business. Uh, Neil was a partner in business. Sujin was a partner. There's two other partners. They all got out and then I was able to take it over, but I was lucky enough that the bet fortunately worked out. So. Yeah, look, no, it's, it's really impressive. Um, Cause we spoke, yeah, quite some time ago and you've been able to scale the, the agency to, to, you know, really decent height. So I'm curious, like, and then we'll, we'll talk about leveling up, but I'm curious, like, because a lot of people are starting agencies now. It's a bit of a hot thing, right? Like you, yeah. you have skills, let's just say, you know how to write content really, really well. You start a content marketing agency, you'll start getting clients, then you can't fulfill the work. Then you either get a contractor, low risk, stuff offshoring some of the work then eventually you get first full-time employee then you get more clients and then off you go and then it's a very people intensive business so it's difficult to scale um so you've scaled it reasonably fast since we last spoke to you know multiple eight figures that's pretty impressive yeah no i I appreciate that and and so if i think about the agency model the, the traditional agency model to your point, it's, it's very tough to scale because there's a quality control issue. The more clients you have, the more people you have to have, the more inconsistent your offering becomes versus you, you're offering products, right? You might be offering, you know, training and things like that. That's a consistent experience across the board. Um, if they're just going through the course, maybe it might be a little different if you have coaches and things like that, but you know, it, I think the tough thing is if you start an agency, just understand what you're trying to do. If it's to try to build a great lifestyle, it's a great cash flow business, right? Um, and you know, if you do want to scale it, just understand there's more headaches that come with that. Um, but again, you know, you can have a different thesis too. Again, we'll take a look at uh, MetaLab as an example. So Tiny Capital, for those that don't know, uh, based in Canada, they started with MetaLab first, the web design agency. They kick out a ton of profits, the user profits to go buy other internet businesses, and that's the thesis. And that's largely what what we're working towards, right? We think of ourselves as a as a product studio. So it just depends on the game you want to play. If you want to do a multi eight figure agency um, with hundreds of employees, definitely you can do that, right? Or if you want to have a great lifestyle business, there's nothing wrong with that word. Um, it just depends on the level that you want to play at. If you want to get to the next level, you just have to defeat the current one. Hmm. So you're using the agency in many ways as a springboard to launch other ventures like the podcast, like the SaaS company, which I think is really smart because then you, you see where the problems are if you have a, a similar kind of customer base. So you can embed, um, you know, a software, you can you know, do all sorts of things. So, yeah, I'd love to talk to you about your latest book. Is this your first book? Yeah, it's my first book. Leveling Up. Um, what compelled you to write this book? 
Yeah. Well, let, let me ask you a question, Nathan. I mean, uh, did you play sports in high school or games in high school? Both. I used to play tennis and table okay. tennis, but I used to also play Counter-Strike. And yeah. uh, I lost a good part of my life playing that game. <laughs> what did you learn from tennis? Mental, like patience, like mental game kind of stuff. Like you yeah. could lose a whole set, but then you could come back. Like, yeah, you just, yeah. Dude, I mean, th that's the thing, right? Because if you think about sports, at the end of the day, sports is just a game. And so there's always a stigma towards something it's dismissed initially. Right. So when you think about snap, it was initially dismissed as something where you just send kind of dirty pictures. When you think about Bitcoin initially, it was dismissed as a toy games were dismissed as a toy initially. Now you it's inevitable. You can't stop it. And so I think there's a stigma towards it until people are forced to acknowledge it. I think you have over 3 billion people in the world that have played games. My, the only thing I was good at in, in high school growing up, the only thing I had confidence in was games, right? This is the only thing I was good at. So, you know, 11 years old or so, I was part of pretty good guilds or teams where people were like lawyers, people were people that like rich people that had planes and there's like college people. So I was like an 11 year old kid. Um, and so I was like, I felt like I was part of something bigger than myself. I was part of a community, which is, you think about founder, you guys have built a great community, right? And that's what it's all about, you know, connecting people. Um, and so I learned so much from games. I learned resilience. I learned teamwork from poker. I learned how to think in bets, how to really invest for the long term, right? And how to understand that even if I bring my A game for three to six months or 12 months at a time, I can still lose that entire year. Um, so there's just so many dynamics within the, the world of gaming that, you know, you can go into that world, you can train, just make sure that you're not stuck in there for too long, right? So the, the message here is just gaming creates leaders. And I, I think it's a really important thing for people that uh, to understand that you shouldn't be you know, down on yourself because you, you know, you're, you're good at games or um, you're spending a lot of time on it. Just understand that you're in the shadow world and you have to eventually come out of it. Mm, interesting. So you're an esports player. What did you play? So Counter-Strike, I was, um, I was part of, so I remember there was a, there's Cal, Cal Invitational. So I was part of a Cal I team. Um, I played a lot of Warcraft three. I was part of a, a, a bunch of different uh, clans there. A lot of EverQuest. I spent a lot of time on MMO. So a lot of EverQuest, a lot of World of Warcraft. Ah, interesting. And it's funny you talk about, like you say that gaming creates leaders. Cause I never forget, um, one of my mentors, uh, Mitch Harper, who founded, uh, co-founded big commerce. Um, yeah. I remember one time I was hiring and I said, oh, look, I'm looking at this person and I'm not sure because she's a gamer. And that means like she probably would. And she said she, she stays up late and games. And I'm like, I'm not sure because maybe she might come to work, um, you know, like really tired and not engaged and all these other things. And he said to me, he was like, what do you want about? That's a really good thing. He's like, I love to hire gamers because they're incredible problem solvers and they're extremely competitive. This is exactly what it is. I mean, the, the time we spent in the game, it just, it's, we're, we got competitive where it was probably too unhealthy. Like 3 a.m., we're playing World of Warcraft in college. We get a call from our guild. So our guild leader would call us at 3 a.m. We'd wake up. It's like, hey, the boss popped, right? So there's a, there's a boss that spawned. And to stop the other rival guild from getting to it first, we would arrive there first and be waiting for them. And we'd take care of them a couple of times before we get to the boss, right? Um, but that would, it was unhealthy habits. That's why I'm saying like, there has to be a balance, right? You can't, you play too much sports, you might tear your ACL or, or, or things like that. It's same thing with gaming too. So to your point, I, I totally agree with that. You react a lot faster. You communicate better. There's just a lot of different dynamics. Yeah, it's crazy. I'm also thinking back to like um, that podcast called Startup by Alex Bloomberg. Yeah. I remember one time he went um, to meet up with one of a potential investor, Matt Mazio, and the founder, one of the founders of Uber, Travis, I'm pretty sure. And um, he told this story about how um, he went, he was up at like the mountains with Travis and um, they were playing Wii tennis or something, something crazy, like a Wii game. And um, like it was the only thing they could do. And the, the, the guy, the, the venture capitalist, Matt Mazio, his dad was playing and he was a really competitive guy and thought he was really good. And then um, like, yeah, like uh, Travis played 
against him and absolutely floored him. And it turned out he was like one of the top players in the world at this whatever we game, I think it was we tennis. And he said, that's why I invested him because I've never seen like that person is the most competitive person I have ever seen. And it's kind of reflective for like how Uber has been so aggressive taking the market. Um, so yeah, I, after that experience, like learning from Mitch, I actually like to hire gamers and I think um, there's something there. So let's talk about Did the book. Her? No, it wasn't, it, that, that person wasn't a fit, but, it, but, <laughs> but future yeah. people, yes, I, I have hired strategically uh, people that, that, that are gamers, I like it. So um, I'm curious, let's talk about more of the book. Like what are the 15 personal power-ups? Like what can people expect to learn from your experience? Yeah. So those of you that can see the video, I'll just pop it up real quick. This is what it looks like. So I, by the way, like actually, actually seeing the physical copies and feeling it is way different than seeing like a PDF. Um, but, and, and you would know that better than anybody else, but um, the, so the, the power-ups I'm talking about in the book, fundamentally, if you think about life, you're going out throughout life and you're collecting things, right? Whether it's habits, whether they're mental models, um, and some of the habits you have to continue to sharpen. So for example, your daily meditation practice or your daily training habit or your daily you know, reading habit, you constantly have to refresh that every day, right? It's like when you get a sword, you keep using it over time, it's going to break eventually. You have to keep sharpening it um, or repair the durability. Um, and so the idea here is that um, you know, one of the power-ups that really sticks with me, and people hate this one because um, it doesn't resonate with, with humans, uh, I think most people, is I have a chapter called Thievery. And the whole idea behind that, I actually won a championship when I was about 12 years old. And um, this is like, these are one-on-one -on -one duels with people in EverQuest. And um, I remember that I had no strategy going into it. I didn't know what to do. And I got destroyed in the preliminaries, right? These were, these matches didn't count. And when it, when, when it came time to, to fight, um, I, I was actually observing, you know, these one-on-one -on -one battles first. And I copied this one German person. I was like, oh, I'll just take that and iterate on it what ended up happening was I didn't lose beyond that. Like I just swept everyone. Right. And even in the finals, I just swept the, swept the guy. Um, and so at that very moment at 12 years old, I was like, Oh, you know what? I think I just need to like probably just iterate on what other people are doing. And, but if you think about what Steve Jobs says, look, everything in life is the remix. What do they do with Xerox? They took the mouse, they took the GUI. Okay. Um, and then you think about, you know, everything that we're, that's been built so far, you, let's look at a SpaceX, right? Uh, the rockets fundamentally look the same, but you know, I'm not, I'm not oversimplifying this. I'm not trying to, it's just, you add on the ability to bring the rocket back. That's no small feat, but it is an iteration on top. Right. So I think, you know, a lot of people, they get to um, attach to the idea that everything has to be original when at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's all about just getting the right information and, and then kind of distilling it and then maybe iterating on it, maybe 20 to 30% and boom, it is quote unquote original. So. Mm, yeah, I'm a big fan of that. Like um, a lot of like, you know, when I think about things at Founder, it's looking at models, it's looking at products in even other niches or industries, but playing in the same kind of space. And like, what can you draw inspiration from, which is very, yeah. very powerful. Um, like, you know, a lot of people, when they want to start a business, they think to, I guess, like, oh, you know, I don't have a good enough idea. But oftentimes it's like looking at a product or a service and how can you tweak it, refine it, improve upon it just 20, 30%. Yep, totally. hundred percent, right? I think, look, even if we think about, let, let's use Founder Magazine as an example. You, you guys have really good design and you've integrated what you've looked at, what other people are doing in terms of models. Like, oh, education makes a lot of sense. Okay, let's pull that in. Let's add our design element to it and let's add the magazine portion to it too. And then boom, we got something that's really unique, which I think it is. So, yeah. no, Thank you. So what else would you like to talk about when it comes to leveling up? I think it's really important to think long term. I think, you know, early in my career, it was just, oh my God, everyone's ahead of me, right? It's, I'm comparing my chapter one to someone else's chapter 25. And I, I think it's really important to think in decades. I'm speaking for myself really right now. It's understanding that, I have, by the way, I have this turtle over here that's really um, been working with my coach on this. And um, we started looking at all the feedback over the years and then understanding that, um, hey, it's okay to slow down. It's okay to, think in decades, because that's when things happen. It, it's short term, you can have urgency, but um, being patient, right? It's not saying just don't sit, just don't be idle, but 
um, that's what it is. And so I'm looking at this Pokemon card over here. I bought it from one of my former employees. So it's this, oh, uh, wow. this Charizard Japanese one. I, you know, it's, it's not like one of those. Expensive? What's that? Is that expensive? Yeah. This, so this one's like, this one's two grand. I mean, there's other Charizards that are like 75 grand, but I'm just like, you know what? I'm just going to buy it and hold it. Right. And so when I think about, you know, businesses in general, let's look at a Warren Buffett, uh, like he buys and holds. And so, you know, $85 billion net worth, 81 billion of it didn't come until after his 65th birthday. And so, you know, time in market is greater than timing the market. So how long can you wait? Because most people can't wait. Most people get too impatient and then they sell up, but then you stop the compounding when you do that. Or when you decide to take a profit, I'm not saying everyone should do this, but every single time you decide to take a profit, taxes need to go out and your compounding slows down, right? So it's really on you to decide how far you can push it, but just understanding that most of the people that are quote unquote wealthy had the patience to get there. And um, yeah, thinking in decades or even in like 25 year sprints, you know, probably, probably a good idea. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point. Like, um, especially in today's age, you know, you see, you see like, you know, the people on Instagram, you read about these successful entrepreneurs and, it takes time. Like it really, really does take time. Um, uh, like, you know, it's funny as well. Like I think we probably met, I don't even know how we met long time ago. Right. But like, like over time, our journeys and brands have slowly grown. Right. And um, it just takes time. You just have to be disciplined and consistent. I mean, I'll give examples, right? And I'd love to hear yours. I mean, we'll, we'll do yours when we do, do the podcast. But um, I, I mean, man, look, it, when I think about the, the, the leveling up podcast, it used to be called Growth Everywhere. After the first year of doing it, I was spending six hours a week on it, doing the show notes, doing the reaching out to people, doing all that, right? And I'm sure it's the same for you. Af after the first year, I was, while I was trying to save single grain, after the first year, I was only getting nine downloads a day. I did the same thing for another year. After the second year, only 30 downloads a day. Now, you know, we don't have the biggest podcast in the world and this is not to brag. I'm just saying like we've compounded to about 48 million downloads so far. Um, right. And some people have huge ones, right? I'm just saying this stuff all takes time. Single grain took a lot of time. And usually what I found is that things take two to three years to start to manifest. Same thing with our software, ClickFlow. You know, two to three years of nothing burger and then boom, it hits. So. Mm. Interesting. So do you talk about marketing at all in the book? Because you are a really good marketer. I appreciate that. Yeah, I do. And, and so, you know what? I mean, I, I would love to learn that on Clubhouse. Um, but, you know, I, there's a chapter in the book called Alchemy. And it's basically on sales and marketing. Because in life, everything you're doing, if you're trying to get a job, if you're trying to win over a spouse, you're doing sales and marketing the whole time. Because sales is just bringing people to the point of sale. Sorry, marketing is bringing people to the point of sale. And then, you know, sales is just closing them. And so, you know, I, I think it's, some people tend to get away from it. They don't want to do it. But, you know, at the end of the day, when we think about digital marketing, look, it, it, arguably you can learn it in 12 weeks and get pretty decent at it. Um, on the sales side of things, you're just constantly honing that habit every single day. You're sharpening the sword. And so it's a really important chapter, I think, um, you know, to become like a well-rounded um, person that makes the most of their abilities, reaches their potential. I, I think it is a necessity. It's a necessary power up. So. So do you think that every founder should be good at marketing? My belief, obviously I'm biased is yes, uh, because there's so much, if you're a founder and you have a good sense of marketing, you can call BS on what's fake and what isn't. If you do not, your radar is not going to be that good in terms of, okay, the person that you hire or everyone that's pitching you on their marketing services, right? Because it can be it, everyone talks a very big game when it comes to marketing, but when it comes to results, it's very hard to see who can do it and who can't, right? So having that radar, and, and by the way, again, this stuff is not that hard to learn, which is why Neil and I, we give away so much of that, that, that free content with marketing school because we just love talking about what we do and it changes so quickly too. It's just, it's fun. Marketing literally to me is just like playing a game. My friend actually, he worked for a uh, investment bank in Goldman Sachs and he actually helped take a company public in Taiwan. He was just looking at everything I was doing for a while. And he's like, dude, this is just like how we're playing Starcraft or like Warcraft when we're in high school. This is the same thing. This is like playing a game. It's resource control. So, and, and you know, all this resource accumulation and control. So resource control and accumulation. What does that mean? Yeah. So have you played Starcraft or Warcraft? 
Yes, I I was more of an Age of Empires kind of guy, but yes, okay. yeah, fun there game, very very fun games. So I'm talking about strategies, um, just for those of you that are listening right now. When you play real time strategy games, um, fundamentally one of the most important things is you know how much resources are you uh, accumulating, and then that defines how much you can expand, how quickly you can, you can expand your operations, right? Now, if someone comes along and destroys your resource line, all your workers that are kind of producing the revenues for your company, you're in trouble, right? Um, so it's a matter of how quickly can you manage things, um, how, how quickly can you expand, and then um, how well do you accumulate? And, and that's, what, that's what the game of business is. It's, it's very similar, StarCraft or any of these, these strategic games to the, the game of business. Hmm, that's a cool analogy. So if somebody wanted to get better at marketing, um, do you think they should focus on getting good at one channel or understanding the foundations around the psychology side? Like where, like, yeah, I'm curious, like, cause I know you said that like, yeah, you can listen to podcasts. You can, you can, you can consume content, but to become an ex- exceptional marketer, I think you talk about patience. I think it takes a long time, man. Yeah, I mean, I think it's fundamentally one of the most important things with marketing is how good your offer is, right? If you have an amazing offer, so for example, if I go to you, Nathan, and say, there's two options here. I might say, Nathan, um, I'll, I'll charge you, you know, $5,000 a month or 15% of ad spend to run your ads. That's the, you know, original offer. The second offer would be Nathan, Hey, you don't pay anything until I perform. So I'm going to front all the, I'm going to take on all the risk. I will do the creative. I'll do the landing pages, all that stuff, but which offer sounds better. Obviously the second one. And so when your offer is that good, everything else just flows, right? Your, your, your creatives, like all the stuff, like the offer is the thing that matters and then you're creative and then all the other stuff. Right. And so I think in that vein, then you understand that, Oh, okay. Um, maybe, I need to understand psych- psychology first, right? And I really recommend reading the book Breakthrough Advertising because that book, it has stood the test of time. There's a Lindy effect on it, right? Um, where, you know, it, it's same thing with how to win friends and influence people. If it's lasted a hundred years, it's going to last another hundred years. And so um, I think that's a good place to start because marketing basically is psychology. That's one aspect of it. Or my path was I took an internship that was very broad. So they taught paid media, they taught SEO and I did it for free. Um, and I just gravitated towards SEO first. So I, I became a T-shaped marketer where I went deep on SEO, but then I started studying all the other disciplines um, where I didn't go as deep, but I understood them pretty well. So your mileage may vary. You can either go for just kind of the high level psychology portion first. There's nothing wrong with that. Or you can go with the doing. My preference is to execute a lot and not just do theory, right? For me, I built my own websites. I tanked a couple of them. Um, and then I really learned through the battle scars. Mm. So, yeah. So you, would you recommend working to become a T-shaped marketer or just focusing on, on, yeah, like the one channel or then, yeah, like you talk about the psychology side, which, yeah, like I've read Breakthrough Advertising. It's a, it's a very dry book. I probably should try yeah. read it again. I'm, I'm a big fan of direct response. Um, but yeah, direct response, you're kind of getting into copywriting and you kind of get into selling with the written word and yeah. You know, here, here's the thing, like talking about Clubhouse again, one of the, the guys I interact with quite a, quite, quite a bit, his name is Craig Clemens. And then he founded a company called Golden Hippo. Hippo. And over $3 billion in sales, super smart guy, very articulate. Um, just like me, he, he basically didn't do that well in school, right? For me, I, I almost got kicked out of high school, almost got kicked out of college, got fired from two jobs. He had a very similar upbringing. Um, and, you know, look at how he talks, look at how he thinks. When we're, we we're both in a room in Clubhouse today and we we're just vibing off of each other while the, the rest of the room was just, was just kind of listening, right? Um, but you can see the level of thinking, the level of conversations, the level of thought. When you have a copywriting background, my God, you're kind of levels above, um, you know, kind of the, the normal person. So to answer your question, though, I, there's that. That's kind of the vouching for the, the theoretical portion. For me, though, I think if you are, because this podcast is founder, if you're aspiring to be a founder, I think going T-shaped 
um, and actually doing it, running some paid ads, doing some SEO stuff, experimenting across the board, that's going to help you because you are eventually, if you get bigger and bigger, you're going to need to know um, how that de department's going to look or whoever's managing marketing, you're going to know when to call BS and when not to. Um, so I, I think that helps for the long term. And by the way, Craig, even though he knows copywriting a lot, he also knows the other channels too. So he did, in a sense, become T-shaped. Yeah, okay, interesting. So if we talk about marketing, how do you plan to market your new book, like Leveling yeah. Up? Obviously, you're going for New York Times, right? Correct? No. No? no. Yeah, so I'll, I'll tell you the long-term play here. So I am going for a Wall Street Journal bestseller. Um, the New York Times, because this is a, you know, I'll share the, the goods on this it's very easy to game the New York times bestsellers list. And so there's a lot of people on there. You're aware. It seems uh, you pay the 500 K you're going to get there, but if your book sucks, like you're, it's like a big PR bump and, and that's it. Right. And I know a, a couple people that have done that. And I'm sure you have too. Um, and so, you know, what I'm aiming for long-term is how does this message, is this message going to stand a test of time? I just mentioned the Lindy effect earlier, which is basically the longer something lasts, if it lasts for a hundred years, can it go for another hundred? debatable on mine because the, the games I'm talking about are already a little dated. Um, but I want the message to stick, right? That's the ultimate goal. I want my book to kind of have a long tail, right? I want it to keep holding. Um, it's a long-term play here. Well, I didn't do it to make money. In fact, if I did, I mean, I've wasted a lot of time and money on it. I spent like five, six years doing this thing. Um, so, yeah. I, by the way, when they first tell you when you're writing a book, I'm like, Oh dude, I'll do it way fast. I'll do it in a year or two years. They're like, no, it's going to take you five to six years. It took me five to six years. They're, they're like, yeah, you're going to go through like seven rounds of edits. I'm like, nah, you know, probably like three. I, I did, I did seven. So um, that's what it took to write the thing. And I'll probably never write one again. I'll probably have a co-writer, but to answer your question, wall street journal bestsellers, I probably need 9,000 sales in, in a week. I think I can get there. Um, I think wall street journal is very um, respected. I think that's great. Um, but that's not the main goal. Now, how we're marketing the book right now. So Clubhouse, again, the audio, the, 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 um, the audio social app, that's been great because I'm on a podcast tour right now, which is why we're talking. Um, so uh, the goal is to get on about 150 podcasts. Um, we're at about 92 right now. Mm -hmm. And just hanging out in Clubhouse the last couple of weeks, I never asked for this, but I got booked on about 30 podcasts and they're pretty legit. Um, yeah. So that's one way of doing it. You do the podcast splits. Yep. Uh, and then the other thing is, you know, this one's a little tougher to duplicate, but we have all our audiences. So we're going to push email. We're going to push all the things. We're in a period of time right now where every day we're talking, we're giving a piece of content, right? So there's that. Now we are also going to be running. Um, we already ran a contest where we did a giveaway. So we gave it like an Alienware computer, some headsets and all that. We're collecting emails for like less than a dollar, um, which is fantastic. Yeah. So, um, and I can keep going, but the final thing I'll say is the, we're also going to, after the launch, um, we're adding a journal to the book too. So we have the rights to do a book funnel because this is not a traditional publisher. This is actually a hybrid publisher. So page two over here, um, I read one of their books, the coaching habit. I thought they did a great job. I actually have the rights to the book. I can do whatever I want. They have a sales team that's pushing it to Barnes and Noble, Amazon. They're selling it right now. So I get the best of both worlds, right? So it just depends on what you want to do. My goal is I want to have control so I can do whatever I want from a marketing perspective long-term, but from just a pure book perspective, I want the message to spread. So, yeah, oh, and in Clubhouse, by the way, final thing I'll say, I've been hitting up a lot of people. I've been joining these esports rooms, Capcom people, Xbox people, whatever. I just DM them say, hey, can I send you a copy of my book? Works out perfectly. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. I like what you've done on the publishing side. So you will create a free plus shipping offer eventually, you reckon? Yep. And the back end of that will be your agency? No, so that's a great question. So um, the so we'll start with the book first. And then I have I have I have this I have my five minute journal over here, but we have a we have a similar journal coming out. So it would go to a free plus shipping offer, right? So they're paying nine bucks for shipping. And then there'll be a one-time offer to buy the journal. You can buy one, three, 10 or whatever. And then in the back end, we'll have a free newsletter. That's the plan. Kind of like, um, think about morning brew, think about the hustle. And then in there we'll have ads for multiple things, right? It could be our marketing training. It could be the, the, the peer group that I do with Neil. So once we bring up back our live events, that does really well. Um, we have our agency, we have the software. There's a whole bunch of goodies that we have. And so that would be the play. Got you, got you, got you. Oh, that's really smart. So, um, yeah, if you, can, if you can get the book funnel to work, 
then you over time can make it compound even if yep. you break even or lose money on the front as long as you've got your back end sorted. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, you can continue to spread the message. 100%. That's, that's the play. I see. And, how, you know, one thing I've always been curious about is um, so when it comes to like Wall Street Journal, New York Times, I see sometimes people become Wall Street Journal or New York Times like way later. What, yeah. Like, how does that work? So I'll give you two things. Okay, I'll be very transparent here. There's actually a guy that can do Wall Street Journal's bestsellers. You have to pay him like 45 grand, I think. And he does this thing where he converts your book to cheaper. And then you can, you'll basically get like top three, right? Um, and so that, that's one. The other one is um, the coaching habit actually did this. So he didn't become um, Wall Street Journal bestsellers until maybe a year into it, right? And so all, I think he did this crazy push in one week. And then basically there's something called like book bub or whatever. And, yeah, 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 yeah. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. So he did that. And, but Tim Ferriss also did this. So I think what every once in a while you might get like a pop from somewhere and then all of a sudden you get 9,000 sales. Right. Um, so you can do it like the two ways I mentioned, or you can, you know, somehow you get some type of PR bump. Yeah. Got you. And then, then you're on the list for like whatever time period. And then you can use that as your yeah. forever. Yeah. yeah. Got you. Oh, interesting. Well, dude, we've talked about like a ton of different things, interesting things. Um, anything else that you would like to talk about while we work towards wrapping up when it comes to leveling up? I think, you know, I, I appreciate all this. I, I think, look, at the end of the day, the 15 power-ups are, are, are not enough. I think, you know, it's life is a series of level ups and, you know, you start out in school first, you start to build the habits, which is kind of fundamentally what the book is about. And then from there, you start working somewhere and then you level up to kind of to your point earlier, you can start freelancing. Then you can start the agency, right? Then you can start building products if you want. Then you can start becoming, build a platform business or whatever. And then you can become an investor, right? Not the, all of these are not mutually exclusive, but those are the levels. Um, and so, you know, again, like you don't deserve to go to the next level until you beat the current one. Um, and I, I think it's just really important to understand that also the 15 power-ups, that's just the beginning. There's so many other, other power-ups to, to collect and um, it's not easy to maintain everything. So you have to decide what works for you. Um, and that's what I would say. Amazing. Well, look, um, we will wrap there, man. But thank you so much for your time. This is a really, really fun conversation. I learned a ton from this. Even just like I, I knew people around like all sorts of things around books. And yeah, no, this is awesome, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. You're welcome. Awesome. Hey guys, hope you're loving our videos and that you're getting heaps of value from them. If you are, make sure to hit the like button and make sure to subscribe to join the Founder Fam. If you did enjoy this video and want to continue to master your skills, make sure you click here to access your free training now. We will go into way more depth with this founder.